hold on. <laughs> oh, yes, okay, we're starting. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Bob Tintner. I'm here with Mike Jones and my partner Ed Hayes. Uh, and we're here to do VIP's semi-annual quiet title training. Um, you are getting CLE credit, so please remember to sign in. We're not gonna give codes or anything because we're doing this live. Um, but you will need to sign in next to your name in order to get CLE credit. Um, obviously, if you have to leave early, just make sure that you notify that or identify that you're leaving early. Um, this is slightly unusual for a CLE in the sense that it's designed to be very interactive and to provide you with training. Um, it's through, obviously, Philadelphia VIP, and I'm going to let Mike talk about VIP. Um, the organization. I will mention that um, although Ed and I are partners here at Fox Rothschild, um, both handling commercial litigation, um, I'm also on the, um, the board of Philadelphia VIP and I've been a VIP volunteer for some 20 years. I won't mention how long Ed has been volunteering for VIP, um, but Ed has been doing this training for probably as long as I've been in practice. Um, so hopefully you, you will get the benefit of our expertise and understanding about this particular area of the law. Um, obviously, the program is designed to help you take on these types of cases. Uh, ideally, we would like you to volunteer with Philadelphia VIP, and I'll let Mike talk about that. But obviously, this is a great opportunity to, to, to understand and learn a new area of the law for those of you who already practice in the area to get some added expertise and the benefit of hearing from practitioners and hopefully we will be able to talk about some of the cases. We have some hypotheticals that we've been using for many years, which describes basically the basic circumstances that are often um, faced by clients who come into VIP and who are looking for representation. Um, I'm gonna turn it over very briefly to let Mike sort of do an overview of the program, and then we will get back in and talk about sort of the, the background of this area of the law and then go through the hypotheticals and the actual training component of the presentation. Thank you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Just a brief agenda. We're gonna, we've already done introductions. We're gonna do a history of VIP and pro bono. We'll talk about um, the overview of Tangled Title in Philadelphia. I'm going to get to the meat and potatoes of this, the quiet title training. You have a roadmap available to you over here. If you've just entered a couple things, there's a place to sign in if you're looking to get CLE. Uh, there's also a manual, and then there's also a number of documents. If you find over in the documents, there will be a case list along with the roadmap, which is going to assist you throughout this process, and the hypotheticals. Feel free, as Bob said, to get up and grab them, ask questions, be as involved as you choose to. Um, about Philadelphia VIP, we're a legal services organization that's existed since 1981. We do all pro bono all the time. Um, we leverage the powerful resources of the community to help our low income clients get access to justice, which means that we have volunteer attorneys, volunteer paralegals, volunteer notaries, volunteer everyone to do the work for our clients. We have a number of different legal areas, but um, Philadelphia is in need of free attorneys. Uh, we are the poorest large city in the United States. Um, the cost of legal services is extremely high, and when you meet, when a person who is in need of legal assistance cannot afford that, this creates a civil, civil justice gap. Um, as a result, volunteers are needed. Um, <clears throat> last year, we helped 3,500 Philadelphians get services through Philly VIP. Um, we've engaged 1,400 different volunteers throughout that entire process last year. Um, there are over 10,000 attorneys in Philadelphia. God help us, but we <laughs> can always use more attorneys to help. Um, and we have been spending 20 years getting this tangled title program um, to where it is. I just came from a national conference last week, and I will say that we are uh, streets ahead of everyone else, so um, consider yourself in a wonderful company. Um, Philadelphia's tangled title landscape, so homeowners. Uh, Philadelphia is a homeownership city. More than 53% of people in Philly own their home. Um, over one-third of the homeowners have an income of under $35,000. The cost of probate filing fee when someone dies, when the record owner dies, can be up to $500 and then some. 
Um, there is a significant number of, of people in Philadelphia, specifically within the black community, who do not have um, estate planning documents and thus perpetuating tangled title. So again, for the 900th time and for more, you'll hear me, volunteers are necessary in this. You'll see on this map right here, this is from the Pew report that was coming out in August 2021. Um, the dark blue areas in the upper north and the southwest are the areas that are most impacted by tangled title. Um, that is a total of 10,000, at least 10,000 properties are impacted by the tangled title in Philadelphia collectively worth $1.1 billion. Um, our black neighbors who are low income are the hardest hit. And as I had mentioned, the North, Upper North, and Southwest and West are the areas where there is the highest number of tracks with Tangle Title. As I had mentioned, the high cost of probate filing fee goes into the average cost to resolve Tangle Title, but there's also transfer, transfer taxes, inheritance taxes, and the costs of attorneys. Um, so, with that, um, you understand how tangled titles can come to exist. There are a number of different ways. I've alluded to um, the, the issue of probate, heirs' properties, where a deceased record owner dies and you need to probate the estate to get title. However, there are a number of other ways that people can have equitable ownership in property. And they can come in the form of adverse possession, um, fraudulent conveyances, lease purchase agreements, and we also have some mortgage satisfactions. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to the people who know exactly what they're talking about um, to, discuss, to discuss what goes into these cases. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. Let, let me just make a plug for VIP. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the organization, um, VIP, which was founded by the Philadelphia Bar Association, is the hub of pro bono legal services in Philadelphia. For those of you that don't know, especially in the quiet title arena, VIP is the leader. Why is it the leader? Because many of the individuals who come for pro bono legal services, who walk in the door at community legal services, largely are referred to Philadelphia VIP because of their ability and their network to get volunteer attorneys to help them. So, and I'm also gonna just make a plug for VIP in general in the sense that if this ultimately is not something that you think you want to handle, there are many other ways to volunteer with VIP to handle cases. Whether it's handling a personal injury defense matter where there's no insurance, whether it's being involved in the small business clinic, whether it's handling a custody matter, there are lots of different ways that you can volunteer and assist Philadelphia VIP, assist low income Philadelphians. So I did obviously want to make that plug. The other reason that we are here Ed and me to, to do this program is because Philadelphia is a very old city in addition to a very poor city. What that means is, is there are a lot of properties that have been in essence tangled because they've been owned through generations by a family, but the current actual record owner of the property is dead or has been dead for generations. And what that means is it, it, it inhibits the ability of the now current equitable owner or resident to alienate that property. They can't leave that property in a will if technically they are not the record owner and own it. So this process of trying to untangle the title actually benefits all of us. It's also the result when you have a lot of dead people who own property, often you see that they're not paying real estate taxes, they're not paying their water bills, and they can't get assistance on their home because they're not listed as the record owner. So the process starts with what we're here to talk about and to volunteer, to help untangle the title, put title in the name of the person who should have title, and then take the necessary steps, whether it's ultimately getting an estate plan in order, whether it's getting homeownership assistance, whether it's getting onto um, an owner-occupied tax payment plan to pay off the real estate taxes, helping our clients, our VIP clients, become better citizens. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed, who I, I should mention is not just sort of, I will call him the guru of title issues in Pennsylvania, having been um, a practitioner in this area for, I don't want to age him too much, but let's just say it's been many, many decades. Um, but he is also my mentor. He is the person that I have been fortunate enough since the day I started at Fox Rothschild to work with and to learn from. So we're very fortunate to have Ed here with us. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. Um, we have done these for a long time, so I think we've got a proven track record 
of how to march through this process. And for those of you who don't do any of this work, uh, it's a totally alien area of the law, and there's often a lack of comfort uh, that you'd be able to handle one of these matters, and as a result, people don't want to volunteer. Um, so what we try to do is start this program off with some hypotheticals. Um, and for those of you that don't practice in this area, I assume when you hear the hypotheticals, you're going to say, I have no idea what to do with that hypothetical. We'll then march you through the um, processes that you can use, some of the legal theories that you can use, some of the pitfalls that you have to watch out for. And then at the conclusion, we like to go back to those hypotheticals again. And if Bob and I have done half a decent job, you should look at those hypotheticals and say, oh, okay, now I know what I will do. I now understand what theories I'm going to raise. I now understand what process I'm going to use. Now I feel comfortable taking a case. And then maybe at the end of the process here, you'll talk to Mike about taking a case. Uh, do not feel like you're out on an island if you agree to take one of these cases. Uh, I know Bob mentors a lot of attorneys. I mentor a lot of attorneys. There are other people who agree to mentor. So you're never, even if you're in a single practitioner location, you're not alone. Okay, there are people available that if you take a case, we are there to help you so that you don't ever have to feel uncomfortable. You don't ever have to feel like you don't know what you're doing. People are there to assist you. So let's start with the hypotheticals, if we can. We'll go through the hypotheticals. I don't Mike, are they somewhere in the materials? Yes. Okay. And we handed them out, too, so people have them. If you want to look in front of them, there's right. and, a set. And I will tell you, having done these for 40 years, uh, these are very typical factual scenarios that a VIP client faces. Uh, so we're not just making these up. These are what these people are facing on a regular basis. So in, in the first case, you have Mr. and Mrs. Smith who are married in 1964. After saving money so that they can buy their home, they purchase a property in 1974 and take title as tenants by the entireties. Shortly after the purchase of the property, Mr. Smith leaves the state with his main squeeze, the other woman. In 1992, Mr. Smith obtains a divorce decree from the family court in Charleston, South Carolina. As part of that decree, Mrs. Smith is to obtain the use, title, and possession of the marital home in Philadelphia. Mr. Smith is directed to sign the documents that are necessary to convey title to Mrs. Smith. Not surprisingly, Mr. Smith doesn't do anything about it. Mrs. Smith wants nothing to do with Mr. Smith, so she does nothing about it. In 1998, Mrs. Smith seeks a home equity loan to make improvements to the property. The lender indicates that it is unwilling to make a loan to Mrs. Smith unless Mr. Smith executes the note and mortgage because his name is still on the title to the property. Uh, how do you fix the problem? And it's interesting. I'm now realizing these dates are so old because we probably gave this first in the late 90s. But that, that's the first hypothetical. The second hypothetical, uh, Mrs. Smith has been renting a property for years. She finds a house she'd like to purchase and the price is one that's acceptable to her. She signs an agreement of sale with Mr. and Mrs. Jones, who own the property, and they tell her if she'll pay $3,000 down at the time of signing the agreement and pays an additional $2,500 in two weeks, they will transfer the property over to her. Mrs. Smith pays the down payment, and the additional money is called for under the agreement. Mr. and Mrs. Jones execute a bill of sale uh, and agree to record a deed conveying title to the property. Mr. and Mrs. Jones never record that deed. Mrs. Smith learns that no deed was ever recorded when she attempts on a later date to convey title to the property into joint ownership with her new husband. How do you fix that problem? Uh, the third one is a lease purchase issue. Mr. and Mrs. Smith have been leasing property since 1985 from Mr. and Mrs. Jones. You'll see a theme here. Mr. and Mrs. Jones are always the bad guys. Uh, in 1990, the Smiths enter into a lease purchase agreement, which provides that all of the rental payments that they make will be considered payments against the purchase price of $10,000, and that once the $10,000 is paid, the title will be transferred to the Smiths. 
The full $10,000 is paid in 1995. The Smiths no longer make lease payments. The Smiths assume that once the last payment is made, the property has now been moved over into their ownership. They continue to reside in the property. In 1999, the Smiths need to make repairs and they look to mortgage the property which they think they own. The lender refuses to make the loan because the property is still in the name of Mr. and Mrs. Jones. The Smiths reach out to the Joneses and ask them to execute a deed. They refuse to do so unless they're paid an additional $5,000 for their trouble. In addition, the public records now reflect that a judgment's been entered against Mr. and Mrs. Jones in 1997 by a credit card company for $14,000. How do you fix the problem? The fourth, again, not an uncommon situation. The Smiths have owned their home since 1962. At the time they bought the property, they got a $12,000 mortgage from the ABC Mortgage Company. The mortgage was paid in full in 1992. The Smiths enter into an agreement of sale to sell the property to Mr. and Mrs. Williams. The title search performed in connection with the sale discloses that that mortgage is still of record and has never been satisfied. For purposes of this hypothetical, we're going to ask you is to assume two different things. First, that the mortgage company is still in business. And secondly, the mortgage company has been out of business for 15 years. Uh, the final hypothetical, Mrs. Smith has been living in the property at 123 Main Street with her grandparents and her mother since her birth. Her grandparents pass away in 1964. Her mother passes away in 1993. She has paid all the taxes on the property since her mother passed away. She's now interested in mortgaging the property to make some necessary improvements. She's turned down because the title to the property is in her grandparents' name and cannot be mortgaged. How do you fix the problem? So again, typical problems that VIP clients face, um, and, and they often come up because the VIP client needs to do something with respect to the property. There's an urgency. They're selling. They're looking to mortgage because the roof has a hole in it and they want it to be fixed. They're trying to enter into an agreement to pay back taxes. Uh, so normally they come in panic stricken uh, because as far as they're concerned, this is their home and they can't do something with their home because there's a problem with the title. So um, they're often, as I said, panic stricken when they come to you. And one of the things you want to be sure when you take these cases is you not give them an unrealistic expectation of how quickly you can fix the problem. So if they have an agreement of sale and they're not entitled to the property, you have to realistically tell them you may very well lose the agreement of sale because the buyer may not wait for nine months or a year while you try to fix the problem. If they've got a roof leak and the lender is not going to provide them with a the mortgage, you can't tell them, don't worry about it, we'll have it fixed next week. These are not problems that typically can be fixed quickly. So you want to have a, a realistic expectation as to what you can do for the client and express to the client a realistic expectation of what they expect to get back from you. I will make one point, though. Unlike when I first started doing this work, where the city of Philadelphia would never enter into um, an owner-occupied property agreement with a non record owner or where you could never get home ownership assistance if you were not the record owner. They have become, shall I say, a little bit more flexible. Certainly on the owner occupied real estate plan, they will they will work with you. They've gotten a little better. They understand that there are a lot of tangled title problems. They understand that it takes, as Ed said, a substantial amount of time to fix the problem. So I would encourage you to work if you have one of those cases to work with VIP who has contacts at a lot of these offices to try to see what can be done to sort of satisfy the emergency or exigent element of the client situation. And, and the reason that becomes important is when you're looking at one of these cases when it comes into the office, don't necessarily assume that the way to fix it is to file suit the next day. Uh, the first thing you want to do is see, is there, excuse me, some way that you can resolve the problem voluntarily? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, who wouldn't execute the deed for the Smiths, may feel differently if you send a letter to them and say you're going to be sued. So you always want to look and see, is there an alternative way to resolve the problem? Because litigation is not the way to go if you can avoid it. Okay, So you always want to see, how can I fix it? Now, having said that, you need to be extremely careful 
that if you're going to fix one of these problems without litigation, that you fix it properly. And, and what do I mean by that? And, and that is that you have to have your eyes open about the scope and the breadth of the problem that your client actually has before deciding it can be fixed. So in the scenario that we had with Mr. and Mrs. Jones, it would have been great for Mr. and Mrs. Jones to sign a deed over to the Smiths. But if you recall in the hypothetical, a judgment had been entered against the Joneses while their name was still on the property. So you may be thrilled to get a deed from the Joneses and you give it to your client. And the next thing you hear a month later is that somebody's bringing a judgment or an execution proceeding selling their home based on the judgment. So you've got to be completely sensitive to all of the issues that are outstanding before deciding which way to go. Now, what is one of the most important pieces of information to know? And that is what the record state of the title is to the property. Okay, Pennsylvania is what's called a race notice statute. Uh, and that basically says that if there are competing interests in real estate, the first to record their document is the one that gets protection. So there's a race to the courthouse for purposes of providing notice. Even though you may have a deed to property that is earlier in time than someone else's, if they get their deed on the record before, you may end up losing. So it's critical that you know exactly what the status of title is, and it's critical that you know everyone that might have some claim to the title so that when you bring a legal proceeding to fix it, you're sure that you name all of the parties that you need to name to fully fix the problem. So in our case with the Joneses, we would not only sue the Joneses, but we might have to sue the judgment creditor because we're going to want their judgment stricken from the property also. Again, the goal here is to get title to the property that is clean for your client. So uh, the first thing you want to do, and it may even come in the package, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, if you take a case, is you want to have a title search done uh, of the property so you can look and see, number one, who's entitled to the property. Number two, are there mortgages on the property? Number three, are there judgments on the property? Number four, is there anything else on the title? that creates a problem for me in fixing this. And it might very well be one of those problems results in you saying to the client, you know what, you don't want this house, okay? Because we can't defeat the $600,000 mortgage that's on the property, or we can't defeat the $80,000 judgment that's on the property. So sometimes your conclusion will be, yes, we can get you title to the property, but you may not necessarily want it. So I can't stress enough, do not go forward with a settlement, do not go forward with a recommendation to the client, do not go forward with litigation without understanding what the status of the title is to the property. Let me just make two points on that. One is remembering from law school the difference between in rem and in persona, right? Judgments or liens that run with the person versus judgments, liens, mortgages, obligations that run with the property, okay? You want to understand things that run with the property would include mortgages, liens, water bills, real estate taxes, those kinds of things. In personam judgments, a little different. Doesn't mean that the judgment isn't on the property, right? But it runs with the person because the person, in essence, was the one who has the obligation. So you want to understand all of that when you're looking at a title report and you're thinking about whether to pursue the claim. Um, very important point about the race notice statute, because um, I talk to Mike about this all the time. It's not enough to just resolve the case and get your order quieting title or having the deed stricken, okay? It is very important that in completing your case, you go right away to get it recorded. Do whatever you need to do to get that recorded because the worst thing you wanna do is fix this possibly complex problem. And because there was a lag time in getting something recorded, someone intervened despite the presence of a list pendants, which we'll talk about, and filed or recorded something of record, okay? You wanna make sure to take that very seriously, the race notice element of this. The sooner you resolve the problem, the sooner that you get your deed or order recorded, the better off your client's position is gonna be. It's not foolproof, right? There are things that can happen, but, but you don't wanna be contributing to any delay in getting the resolution.
the, the process that is most often used, the procedure that's most often used, is what's called an action to quiet title. Uh, and the quiet title rules are set forth starting in Rule 1061 of the Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, when I was first a young lawyer here, uh, one of the then senior people said to me, uh, the most important thing you can do in handling any case is start by reading the rules. And I'm going to urge you. That's what you do, particularly in this area, because the rules are very specific about what you have to say, what you have to do, and what results you can end up with. So take a look at 1061 uh, and the rules after that to get a very good feel for how this process works. Now, what can we do under 1061? Well, 1061 tells you what you can do. Uh, you can either compel an adverse party to commence an action of ejectment, you can determine any right, land, title, or interest in land, or determine the validity or discharge of any document, obligation, or deed affecting any right, land, title, or interest in land. You can compel an adverse party to file, record, cancel, surrender, or satisfy of record, or admit the validity, invalidity, or discharge of any document, obligation, or deed. So it's almost every avenue that you would want available to you, 1061 specifically says you can do. Now, there's also 1061B4, which says you can obtain possession of land sold at a judicial or tax sale. As I always say at these, if you've got a VIP client that says, I need you to help me get title to a property I bought at a tax sale, they shouldn't be a VIP client. So you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll never be looking at 1061B4. You will be looking at B1. B2 and B3. Now, an action to quiet title under 1062 must be brought in the county where the property is located. So <clears throat> your VIP clients are going to be Philadelphia residents. The properties are going to be in Philadelphia. The case has to be filed uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, a very critical situation under the, the quiet title rules is your client must be in possession of the property to bring a quiet title case. Okay. Possession is a jurisdictional prerequisite of an action to quiet title. So one of the first things you want to say to your client who comes into your office is, where do you live? Are you in possession of the property? If he or she says, well, I need to quiet title to the property over on Main Street where my grandparents used to live, then you can't bring a quiet title action. You have to bring an ejectment proceeding. So you don't want to be nine months into a case and get some smart lawyer on the other side who then files to dismiss the case on the basis that you filed the wrong form of action. Um, under 1067, there is no right to a trial by jury in a quiet title action. I would respectfully suggest to you the last thing you want in a quiet title action <laughs> is to have the case decided by a jury of your peers who will know as little about quiet title as the judge that you're sitting before. <laughs> yeah. um, it's also critical that when you bring a quiet title action, you name every party that has a potential interest in the property. Again, ultimately, you want to get an order that quiets title to the property in your client so that your client's the owner of the property, your client owns it free and clear of any claims. You can only get that relief against the parties that you've named in the lawsuit. So it's very embarrassing. Uh, if you go through this whole process, get a quiet title order, you get a certified copy, you file it with the Department of Records, and then lo and behold, Mr. Jones comes along and says, well, that's all fine and good, but you didn't name me as a defendant. I've got an interest in the property. And then the quiet title client comes back in and says, what did you do? Malpractice. I'll fix it. Okay? And that gets back to the importance of the title report. So name everyone that you can possibly think of who has an interest in the property. If you're not sure, then consider naming a John Doe or a Jane Roe being any other persons who might have an interest in the property. It's just critical that you not have someone out there with an interest in the property that you can't name. There's one, there's one exception, and that is the city of Philadelphia, which likely will have an interest in most of your quiet title cases because there are unpaid real estate taxes. And generally what I advise when I'm mentoring lawyers who are handling these is 
don't you don't want the city of Philadelphia named as a defendant in your case. If there's an issue with the real estate taxes, it can be resolved separately. Assume and advise your client, as Ed said, that they're taking this property. If they want this property, they're taking it subject to whatever the real estate taxes past due are owed. And assume that includes interest and penalties, unless you can separately negotiate and get rid of them. But don't use the action to quiet title to do that. You don't want a city solicitor defending this case or getting involved. Um, it's, again, technically, do they have an interest in the property? Yes. But you are taking the property, presumably subject to the real estate taxes. So try not to, if you can, sue the city of Philadelphia in those cases. And that's really the, the, the key point is that, that if you're not going to divest some interest that's held like the city with real estate taxes like the commonwealth possibly for a tax lien then you don't need to name them as a defendant because you're not seeking relief from them what you're going to do with those agencies uh, you know through vip's assistance is to speak with them about how to address the tax you're not divesting the taxes you're going to try to make a payment arrangement uh, you're going to possibly get some concession by the state or the city as to what is owed, but you don't need to name them as a defendant when you're not looking for relief from them. Yes, ma'am, you had a question? What about judgment creditors? They, if you have a basis to contest the judgment, and we'll talk a little bit about one of those bases might be, then you would have to name them if you're looking to get a free and clear order. If you don't name them and you had a basis to contest it, you lose it. Okay, now... A problem that we face in a lot of these cases um, is that you can't find the defendants. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. You know, Mr. Smith in our divorce case is living down in South Carolina in the middle of nowhere. Uh, people who generally defraud VIP clients don't want to be found. Uh, so it's often very, very difficult uh, to get service. And without service, you can't move the case forward, plain and simple. Uh, so one of the things that the rules of civil procedure provide you with is the option to get what's called alternative service. And that's under rule 410. Uh, again, I would suggest to you take a look at the rule uh, because the rule doesn't say, well, I don't know where he is, so judge, let me have alternative service. The rule imposes certain obligations on you to conduct what's called a good faith investigation to locate the defendant. And normally that means you filed your complaint, you know, the sheriff or your process server went out and is unable to serve. Normally it requires more than one service attempt. So you might have to reinstate and send your process server out again before you can in good faith go into the judge with a motion and say, I'd like permission to serve by alternative service. And what do you have to do? Well, the rule again specifically says the types of things you need to do to show good faith. You need to make inquiries of postal authorities pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act. So you submit a FOIA request. Without it, better judges will not give you uh, a, a, an alternative service order. Yes, ma'am. Um, what happens when the post office does not return the you, you send it again, or you walk into the post office, or you would ultimately say, Judge, I've sent four of them, and they haven't responded. Because again, what the judge wants to know is, you're saying I can't serve the person at that address. The judge wants to know, well, is that a good address? Have they given a forwarding order? Were they never known at that address in the first place? I have had that problem. I've resent them again, and other than it being aggravating that you have to send it again, I've had some success getting it back. So that's the first thing you have to do. Uh, the second thing is the rule says you have to make inquiries of relatives, neighbors, friends, and employers of the defendant. Now, you may not know who the relatives are. You may not know who their friends are. You may not know who the employer is. But you might have somebody knock on the door of the house next door to say, hey, does Mr. Smith still live here? You have to look at local telephone directories, voter registration records, local tax records, and motor vehicle records. With, with, you know, with the internet nowadays, if you look, you can find an awful lot of information uh, regarding addresses for people. You can look at motor registration records. Um, again, the idea is you're trying to convince the judge, judge, I've really made a bona fide effort 
to get an address for this person and I'm unable to do it. So please let me make alternative service. Now, what does alternative service mean? It can mean posting of the property. Uh, it can mean sending a letter by certified mail. It can mean sending a letter by ordinary mail. And in the worst of all scenarios, it can mean by having to publish notice of your lawsuit uh, in the newspaper. I urge you, as much as I can urge you about anything I say here today, do not propose in your form of order to the judge that you publish notice of the sale, okay? Because that is as expensive as the day is long uh, to publish. Now, VIP, no one's gonna see it. VIP may have deals, um, but 99% <laughs> of the judges will not require publication if you submit an order which su suggests A, posting, B, certified mail to the last known address, See ordinary mail to the last known address. Most judges are going to accept that if they're satisfied with the level of your investigation. Okay. So again, you always have to think about in your complaint, you have to think about, well, what order do I ultimately want? And I need to ask for it in your motion for alternative service. What order do I want? And you have to ask for it. Do not ask for publication. Now, again, in the old days, you used to file a motion for alternative service. It was signed all the time. Nowadays, judges tend to look more carefully at what you're submitting. And again, you don't want to file a motion, wait 30 days, have the judge deny it on the basis that he or she was not satisfied, then have to start your investigation all over, then file a new motion and wait another 30 days. Again, the idea here is to get your client's relief as quickly as possible. So. So anticipate you may have a service issue. Don't worry about that. There are ways to deal with it, and it is uh, under uh, the rules. Um, yeah. So another question. What happens if you send certified mail to the last known address, but of course the person's not there? So the card doesn't come back. Does that show proof of notice? Like, can you say to the court? It never came back? I have never had to say to a, to a court, except in a tax sale case, where it's a different set of rules, that I had a green card or didn't have a green card. And quite frankly, um, ever since COVID, um, you either still get back, despite the fact they're no longer authorized to do it, a COVID-19 signature on the green card, uh, or the postman just never send it back in anymore. They just don't do it. So. I think in as many cases, you're going to get back nothing or an improper signature as you get a proper signature. My affidavits of service always say, judge, you ordered me to do this on such and such a date. I sent a letter by first class mail on such and such a date. I sent a letter by certified mail uh, because if you wait for the green card to come back, it may never come back. Or again, you're delaying ultimately the ultimate relief. So I've never had it. I've never been in a case where I have not been able to get a judgment because I didn't have a green card attached. It's just that I did it. Now, one other thing before I move away from this uh, is that in your order requesting alternative service, normally it relates to the complaint that you're filing. Um, but arguably, you may have other pleadings that you have to serve in the case after the complaint. So I always put in my alternative service orders that the complaint shall be served by posting, by first class mail, by certified mail. All later pleadings in the case shall be served by first class mail at the last known address. Again, something judges will generally sign, and it then clears you that you don't have to go through the same process again of posting, because again, there's an expense associated with the posting. Um, so your order needs to be very broad. And yeah, the, the critical piece is to comply with the court's order. And since in Philadelphia, you draft the proposed form of order, that doesn't mean the judge always enters it. Be very careful about the wording you use, as Ed says. Um, and, and it is critical that the initial complaint and possibly the list pendants, which we're going to talk about if you have to file one, should be made through initial process, meaning that you do the certified mail, the regular mail, and the posting, and then any subsequent pleading you can just do by first class mail. Once that order is entered, when you do your affidavit of service confirming that you've done it, I always attach the order 
I attached the letter showing I did it, um, just so that if there's ever any question, and then we're gonna talk about the motion for default judgment, I attach the filed affidavit of service that I use. So you're just trying to anticipate that some judge somewhere along the way is gonna be like, I'm not entering this order because you didn't give due process. You wanna prove that you gave due process, that you gave process serve all of the critical components in the case. And, and we're, again, we're talking about primarily service of the complaint, and we have not yet talked about the complaint because right. we'll wait until we talk about the substantive arguments you would make in the complaint. But we want to go through the process first. So obviously, there's an assumption you file your complaint, you're trying to serve it. So let's assume you file your complaint, you either make service or you get an order for alternative service and you serve alternatively and the defendant doesn't respond which is nine times out of 10. What do you do next? Um, we've had a little bit of a debate. Um, for those of you that do litigation, you know about a 237 notice, uh, which is the quote unquote 10 day notice that you have to send before you can enter a judgment by default. Uh, technically, under the Pennsylvania rules, you do not have to send a 10 day notice in a quiet title action. Uh, I still send them in every case and talk to Bob, Bob sends him in every case, every case. <laughs> because the bottom line is you may have a judge who looks ultimately at your motion, who of course is smarter than you, although they've never read the quiet title rules and they will say, counsel, I'm not granting your motion because you didn't give a 10 day notice. And you're not going to argue with the judge. Well, judge, you shouldn't have done that. Cause then you got to file a motion for reconsideration. I didn't need it. It's much easier to just send the 10 day notice. Okay. So you prepare it. You send it to the address, uh, and then you've fulfilled any question in a judge's mind as to whether that should happen. Now, assuming then there's no response after 10 days, you know, in a typical case, you would just go in and file a precipice for judgment. You can't do that in a quiet title case. You have to file a motion. Okay, so in your motion, you're going to have to say, A, I file a complaint, and you attach a copy of the complaint to the motion. The complaint was served on such and such a date. And if there's an alternative service order involved, I always put that in there. And as Bobby says, you know, your, your affidavits of service. And although they're on the dockets, remember in Philadelphia, judges don't look at the dockets. They're not going to look at the pleadings that are on the dockets. They're only going to look at what you give them in the motion. Okay, so you've got your complaint. You've got your service documents on such and such a date after the response was not filed. I gave a 10 day notice. And then you give whatever other affidavits you might need uh, on there about the service of the complaint. And then you ask for a judgment to be entered. You will need a memorandum of law because they will not accept a motion in Philadelphia if it doesn't have a memorandum of law and you'll need a proposed order. And that proposed order should not be different than the relief that you've asked for in your complaint. Okay, because if it is, a judge may say to you, Mr. Hayes, I see you've asked for me to give you one, two, three, four, five different forms of relief here. I look back at the complaint. In the complaint, you only asked for three. So the defendant was only on notice that you were asking for three. Now you're asking me to give you five. I can't do it. So why is that important? It's important because when you decide to file the complaint, you need to figure out what relief do I want? What am I hoping to end up with here? And generally what you're hoping to end up with is an order, and I believe there will probably be some forms uh, in there, but you, you want an order confirming that your client is the owner of the property, uh, barring the defendants from asserting any claim inconsistent with your ownership of the property, uh, you know, potentially addressing any other relief that you want. Um, I always put in there providing for uh, that a copy will be recorded with the Philadelphia Department of Records. Uh, sometimes I guess we can put in some transfer tax issues, which may become complicated. Well, the point being that when you first sit down and prepare your complaint, say to myself, what do I hope to achieve? And, and what you hope to achieve should be the wherefore clause set forth in the complaint. And that wherefore clause should then be consistent with the form of order that you give the judge in the motion. Okay, so you've got your complaint, your service, your 10 day notice, your motion for judgment. And then in a perfect world, the judge will say, this is fantastic. You did a great job, sign the order. 
you'll get the order. And then what you need to do is get a certified copy of the order. About 41, 42 bucks, I think, from judicial records, unless we get them free. We get, we get, we get some for free. Okay. Get them so free. you get a certified order because you can't record a non-certified order with the Philadelphia Department of Records. Okay. So you get a certified order. And then you take that certified order down to the Department of Records, or I think VIP will probably handle that for you, and get it recorded. Because as Bobby says, you know, until that order is recorded, the rights that have been given you to you by the judge are not a matter of public record. Okay? So it's important that you get it down there uh, as quickly as possible. Now, again, the whole idea here is to not let someone else have a claim against the property, or let someone else get a claim against the property while you're fixing the problem, which can often take years. And again, that's why I said I, you can't give a VIP client an unrealistic expectation as to how quickly you're going to be able to fix the problem. So, so how do we protect that while the two years are going by, somebody else is not getting an interest in the property? that's going to defeat us from ultimately quieting title in favor of the VIP client. And that's by filing what's called a list pendants, L-I-S-P-E-N-D-N-S. It's a very simple document um, that simply says, I, that kindly index this action as a list pendants against the property located at 123 North Main Street, comma, Philadelphia, PA, comma, as more particularly described in Exhibit A here too, I hereby certify that an interest in the title to the real estate is the subject of this action. Okay, a very simple document, one page with the legal description attached to it, and you get that filed in your case. Once that indexing takes place in the case, and we'll also talk about whether you also have to do it in the recorder of deeds or not, but, right. but once that indexing takes place, Anybody who takes any interest in the property after that's filed takes it with notice of your rights in the property. So if you file that and then the bad guy gives a new mortgage on the property to somebody else, guess what? That mortgage is not going to be valid against you. If you don't index the Liz pendants, okay, that mortgage may be valid against you. So it's critical that you file that Liz pendants. Now, what if you have a complicated case? It's going to take you a while to do a complete analysis of what needs to be in your complaint. It's going to take you a while to prepare the complaint. Uh, the client only speaks Spanish, so there may be some translation issues that it's going to take time. And you're looking at, well, it may be a month before I can get this done. Well, there's a process in Pennsylvania where you could start an action by summons. And that summons is a single piece of paper that says, Mr. Defendant, by the way, I've sued you. And when you file that in Philadelphia, you get a court term and a number, and you now have a, a caption that you can use to file your list pendants. So that while you're preparing the complaint, while you're doing everything that you need to do to get your complaint of record, you now have a list pendants filed against the property. Now, you have to be careful in Philadelphia um, because there's an argument, probably rightfully so, that you can't start a quiet title action by summons. So if you click on the cover sheet that you're starting a quiet title action by summons, the likelihood is it will get rejected. So if it's really critical that you get that summons filed, I suggest that you call it an equity action in real estate as opposed to a quiet title action and it will get accepted. And then once you file your complaint, you'll simply say complaint to quiet title. So again, just I can't stress enough, you don't want to be sitting on the sidelines figuring out what you're doing when your client's rights may be going away. So the list pendants is a critical document to have. Now, a lot of people believe in an abundance of caution that in addition to indexing the list pendants in the lawsuit that you start, that you should also file it in the Department of Records. Uh, I personally don't think that's necessary. A lot of people disagree with me. There's certainly no downside to doing it other than the expense of filing it. 
Uh, I don't know whether they would waive the fee for that. They, they will? waive the fee. Okay. So and VIP waive, will record it for you. So if they waive the fee, then, then do that also. Because what that does is it puts third parties on another possible avenue of learning that you've got some argument or some claim uh, to the case. For those of you who aren't familiar with title insurance, what, what sort of this is a belt and suspender sort of thing, right? The title insurer, when they do a title search, is obviously going to start with the Department of Records and see what's been recorded. They are also going to check the dockets. They're going to check the common pleas dockets. They're going to check the federal dockets for liens and other, okay? So Ed's point is if you file an action, even if it's called equity real estate, if there is a list pendants of record and it mentions the property address with the legal description, it will be picked up. It will also be picked up if it's recorded with the Department of Record. So the point is, it's more of a belts and suspenders thing, but because for VIP clients, we can get the recording fees waived, we can get the filing fees waived, do it. All you do is send them exactly. I typically will file it. I send it to Mike and say, here, can you get this recorded? They get it recorded. Um, <laughs> before, He's our liaison with the Department of Records. Um, before we get into the substantive arguments, let me just mention the other set of rules that might come into play, uh, and those are the ejectment rules, and they're under 1051. Um, remember what I said, to bring a quiet title action, your VIP client must be in possession of the property. If they're not in possession of the property, the same remedies that they could get in a quiet title action, they can request in an action that's called an action in ejectment. So I would just urge you to look at 1051 and the rules after that to get an idea of what you need to do uh, in an ejectment action. In particular, 1054 uh, says that you need to lay out an abstract of title within your complaint. So basically, you're giving a history of ownership. Um, at under 1055, unlike a quiet title action where your client is already in possession, the ejectment case has someone else in possession, you can also ask for rents. So in addition to asking that the court confirm that you're the owner, you can ask that the person in possession be obligated to pay rent for the time period when they were living in your property. Now, uh, the bad guys don't always have money. Um, the bad guys aren't always around, but why not have a leverage tool? Uh, I have settled any number of these cases by saying you've been in there for two years. The fair rental value of the property is $3,000. Uh, you know, you owe me $79,350. I'm willing to waive that <laughs> if you'll agree to stipulate to my relief and ejectment confirming my client's ownership. So although you're in there to fix the title, uh, don't lose sight of the fact that that's another possible leverage tool uh, that you can put. And, and just like the quiet title action, uh, there's no right to a jury trial uh, in an ejectment action. Okay, so, so, so you're looking at two different procedural um, uh, mechanisms to follow, but very similar in how you handle them, very similar in the relief if you did an ejectment action. You would go through the same thing we talked about before with possibly a summons, a complaint, alternative service if you need it, the motion. It would all be exactly the same. Let me, let me mention one thing about, because this is how you'll see typically an ejectment case, is that the VIP client will get um, served with a complaint and ejectment. So they're actually in possession of the property. They get an ejectment action. You'd be surprised what goes on. Typically, it's the bad actors. It's the people who got them to sign the fraudulent deed have the chutzpah to go into court and say, you need to eject this person. Forget the fact that I forged their signature. Forget the fact that I promised them that I would pay them money and never paid it. That's typically what you're going to see. It comes to VIP, and now suddenly, not only do you have to respond to the ejectment action, but that's where you may want to counterclaim for quiet title relief. That is, it's not the only time you're going to see it, but that is a typical scenario that we often see. Um, you know, I just handled one very recently, very similar to that, almost exactly. Yeah, there are more regularly than not in Philadelphia, I always say when I speak, the dead have an uncanny ability to sell their real estate in Philadelphia. <laughs> um, so you may very well find yourself, I will get to, you may very well find yourself in a situation 
uh, where you have a VIP client who's lived in a property for any number of years and the property was in his or her mother's name. And miraculously, 10 years after the mother passed away, she went to a notary uh, and signed the deed conveying it to the bad guy. Uh, I mean, it happens all the time. Uh, VIP clients' properties um, uh, tend to, to draw the bad guys because often they're behind in taxes. Uh, often they may not be well maintained. Uh, and, and I deal with this all the time because I represent title companies. And, and we're often fighting uh, to try to uphold deeds that were signed by dead people. Uh, and what the bad guys are doing, they're, they're looking at tax sale lists. They're looking to see what properties have liens against them from the city. And they're looking for properties that are generally in a state of disrepair. And what do they do? They prepare a deed. Uh, they sign the dead person's name and convey it to themselves or some other fake person. Uh, they either go into a notary who they know and say, can you notarize this? Or for about 15 bucks, you can get a notary seal. If you go on notary.com, um, you can go in and make your own notary seal, whatever name you want, and you just stamp it. And then it gets taken down to the Department of Records and it gets recorded. And then what typically happens within a very short period of time, that property is then conveyed to someone else, not the bad guy who has no idea that there's a problem with the title to the property, it gets transferred to someone else, and then that someone else finds out your VIP clients in the property and wants to know why. So, I mean, that is a, an unbelievably huge problem in the city of Philadelphia that is never going to go away until the district attorney's office takes a more aggressive approach to putting these people in jail. And they will tell you they're doing it, I will tell you, and I've spoken before city council about it, uh, if they don't have somebody that's doing 10 or 15 of them, they will not prosecute them. Okay, so it's a real problem. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah, um, so case of deed fraud, deed theft, um, victim client is out of possession, thief is in possession, ejectment or quiet title. Ejectment. Again, the, 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 reason don't you you the reason you choose one or the other is simple. Who's in possession? If your client's in possession, it's quiet title. If someone other than your client, and I don't care who they are, if they're not your client, then it must be ejectment. But don't you need to plead title for the ejectment action? Sure you do. And yep. so record title is in the name of the thief. Well, except that you're, you will lay that out, but you will make your claim as to why your claim to the title is superior to the thief's claim. That, oh, by the way, here's the death certificate for my mother. She clearly did not sign the deed from heaven. So then although record titles in the bad guy, here's, here's the rights. Okay. okay, so again, those are the process. Now let's talk about some of the theories. Um, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I need to back up with regards to first day. I had this conversation with the VIP. If the court permits, both Oh, as to how long it needs to stay posted? No, it just needs to be posted. And you want to be sure it's posted during the time period when the complaint is still good. So, in fact, that brings up a good point. A complaint must be served within 30 days if the defendant is in Pennsylvania. There's a longer period if it's out of state. But you obviously didn't get the complaint served, right, within the 30-day period. You get your alternative service order. You have to reinstate the complaint before you then serve it, okay? Because if you don't reinstate it, technically you didn't have the legal authority to serve the first complaint. So again, very easy document, a precipice to reinstate to the excuse me to the prothonotary, kindly reinstate the complaint upon payment of your costs only. You'll file that. The precipice will get accepted. The complaint will get a stamp on it that's been reinstated. Now you're good to serve it. There's nothing under the rules that says you have to be sure the pleading stays posted for any particular period of time. It has to be posted. And I always tell my process servers, I want to know where you posted it. I want to know when you posted it. And I want to see a picture of the thing being posted. And then, then you're okay. 
just for clarity, yes. do you want, you suggest that the complaint get reinstated after the alternative service order has been granted? It should be every 30 days. Every 30 the, days. Consistent with the rules of civil procedure, you should have it calendared that every 30 days until you've actually made good service, just automatically file that precipice and reinstate the complaint. You do not want to give some savvy defense lawyer who may step into the case some argument that you actually served an unripe complaint. So I always tell people just as if it's any other action, just automatically calendar the every 30 days. It's a form, have it ready to go. It'll automatically be, it'll be accepted. Then you'll have the reinstated complaint. What are some of the theories, right, that you're going to use? Because again, it's great to know the process and it's great to know what the end game is to, as to where you want to be. The question is, what's the legal basis upon which you're making the claim that your client is the owner of the property? Uh, one substantive argument is adverse possession. Okay, Adverse possession can be brought by someone claiming actual, continuous, visible and notorious, exclusive possession of a property that's hostile to the interests of the record owner. So actual, continuous, visible, notorious, exclusive, and hostile. What does hostile mean? It doesn't mean you had to have an argument, okay, with the owner of the property. It just means you're in there without permission. Okay, hostile is without permission of the record owner of the property. Actual is you're in the property. Okay, you're actually possessing the property. You're doing it in a way that's visible. Okay, you're not hiding. You're in and out of the property. People can tell you're occupying it. Uh, and it's exclusive for the requisite time period. So that doesn't mean you're in for a year and then you go down the shore for a while and then you come back and then you get back in somebody. It's got to be exclusive for the requisite period of time. And there are two different periods of time now that you have to take into consideration. The, the, the old statute was 21 years. So all of those things have to fit for 21 years. Uh, the legislature amended the statute in 19, I believe, to say primarily with single family residences, it only needs to be 10 years. Okay, so you've got to meet each of those elements for the entire period of time. And if you're able to do that, the courts essentially conclude under the doctrine of adverse possession that the record owner sat on his or her rights in allowing you to be in possession of the property indicative of the fact that you must have an ownership interest uh, in the property. So you had a question first? Uh, yeah, um, I hope this isn't too fact intensive, but so I have uh, one that's rather complicated because for 23, period, 23 years, the person in possession had permission to be there. Then the owner died. And now we are, it's 21 years later. Is that hostile? I don't know the answer okay. to that. Well, it, it's a good question because it brings up something we always discuss in these. Um, what often happens is you'll have a VIP client who has been in the property with permission, whether it's because it was under a lease purchase, whether it was just under a lease. Um, and then at some point in time, that permission stops uh, because the lease purchase expires, the lease expires, the possession has to be hostile before the time period starts to run. So in your scenario, if they were in for 23 years with possess with possession, I'm sorry, with permission, and then at that point in time, the hostility started, they've got another 21 years or 10 as the case may be. So why is that important? Because you have to say to the client who comes into you, who says, hey, it's adverse possession. Well, I'm glad you're a lawyer, but let me ask you some important questions. When did you go in? Who have you been in there with? Have you been in there the whole time? Okay. Did someone allow you to be in there for some period? Because when I'm defending an adverse possession case, the first thing I ask my client, is there any way you can argue they're in there with permission? Okay. It often happens you have with, with boundary disputes between neighbors where, you know, they, they, one neighbor's letting the other one use it for some period of time. Well, they can use it for a hundred years. It's not adverse possession. So it's critical that you ask your client all the questions that will enable you to decide, am I going to be able to meet each one of these prerequisites? 
Now, another problem that you often have uh, is that your client may not have been in possession for 21 years, but her family might have been possession for 15, and now your client's been in possession for 10. Um, there's a doctrine called tacking, T-A-C-K-I-N-G. And the question is, can you tack the rights of the former possessor onto your possession to meet the necessary 21 years? Uh, it is often a fact-sensitive situation, but do not necessarily conclude that just because your client has in, been in possession for 21 or 10, you may be able to find that the person in possession prior to that is possessory rights that you can use. So again, don't necessarily, client says, well, I've only been there for nine years. Ask the next question. Again, how did you get in there? Who was in there before? What's your relationship with that person? And now there could be another complicated factor that usually will not creep into a VIP case, but, but when there have been transfers of title, uh, there's a question of whether or not the adversely possessed land, and it most often happens with lots that are next to a house, whether there's a, and it, it, whether the deed, well, let me back up a minute. Assume you've got a house and you've got a lot next to it. And the former owner of the property for years has fenced the lot next door and used it as a garden. But the former owner didn't own the lot next door. It was owned by the Smiths. Uh, the former owner then sells the property to your client. And the legal description in the property is only of the house. It doesn't include the lot next door. Uh, that can be an issue uh, under the tacking rules because the argument is, well, that person didn't convey to you their claim in connection with the lot next door because it wasn't ripe at that time. They weren't there for 23 years. So again, you shouldn't have that, I don't think, in a VIP case. Um, you're normally just looking to say, can I meet the 10, which normally will apply now for the types of properties that VIP clients have, uh, or the 21. One, one issue with the hostility, because this comes up, many of our VIP clients don't have actual leases. So the question you have to ask is, did the prior owner allow you to live there? And we've seen all sorts of arrangements where it was like, well, yeah, you can be there if you make sure that the property is cleaned up or whatever. They're not actually paying anything. That doesn't mean that they're there hostily. You know, they're, they're there with permission. So even if there's not an official lease agreement, that doesn't mean that you can meet the adverse possession claim, and this often comes up. Um, so just keep that in mind. But we have tons of questions. Yeah, so yeah, well, the other thing, suppose the lot next door is, and I've got is owned by a dead person, been dead for a long time. Right. Uh, the city just hasn't gone to the trouble of putting it up for a tax sale. Um, and so she fences it in and occupies it for 10 years. Can she then file an adverse possession action? It's the estate of Mrs. Smith uh, who's been dead for forever no. and acquired time. A couple answers. First of all, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, for 10 years, because the 10 year. Yeah reduced period applies only to residents. Right? Oh, so you okay. can't use it for lots. Um, secondly, could they file it against the estate? If, if, well, first of all, you can't sue a dead person. Right. So hey, we'll talk estate. a little bit. You have to raise an estate, right. and then you could bring the same. Because, again, unless it's with permission, yeah. okay, it's adverse to the owner, right. whether the owner is dead or not. I don't think that would matter. Okay. But you couldn't do it unless it was 21 years for the lot. Okay. If that um, this is uh, a continuation of the question I had about 23 years of permission, 21 years of that. The fact that the owner dies at year 23 and the tenant in possession never makes another payment and never moves out, does that make the tenant's possession hostile to the estate of the person who died and no estate was ever raised and no relatives ever raised? I would argue that it does yeah. because the payments have stopped. Yeah. And once the payments stop, yeah. the estate and or its representative would have a right to eject you from the property. If they don't do it, right. my argument would be you're in possession hostily. Yeah, and they're sitting on their rights. That's the whole point. Right. Now, does, if, if I'm representing the tenant, does, can I name an estate that has never been formed? No. 
Uh, let's wait till the end of this. Okay. Sorry. Talk, Sorry. Sorry. There's a whole there's a whole other seminar right. uh, on estates, but I, I will. The answer to the question is no. You can't sue a dead person. Yes. You can't sue an estate that doesn't exist. Okay. And you can't sue all the heirs and unknown heirs of the dead person. People do it. You shouldn't. You can't do it. Most yeah. savvy judges will tell you you can't do it. The estate is not a proper party in interest. It has to be an executor, an executrix, an administrator, or administratrix that's been appointed as the proper representative of the estate who can be sued. And I we will, will get you, to that. I will tell you it's a nightmare to do that. But, but again, I, I we'll get really, I'll save all okay. I'll I'll Were there other, go ahead. Um, can you adversely possess against a co-tenant and can you adversely possess against a family member? Well, you can't adversely possess against a co-tenant. And I tried that case, so I know that for a fact. Uh, is the family member an owner of the property? Uh, equitable owner. In what respect? Um, another heir, maybe, or maybe, maybe someone who has some form of uh, privity of contract with another. I will generally say you probably can't if they have an interest in the property. Okay, generally, you can't adversely possess against a co owner of the property, whether they're in possession or not. Okay. Let me make one point about the tenure. I don't know if you were going to cover no, this, but the, the, I don't like it. I mean, I like the idea that the legislature was trying to make it easier. The problem is what it requires you to do is to put the record owner on notice so that they have the right for a year to file an ejectment action to get rid of your client. And so often what happens in these cases is I hear the story where at 14 years we can put we you're poking the bear. OK, you're inviting somebody to do something to now kick your client out of a place that they've been living at peacefully and nobody's made any trouble. Often you may make the decision to wait the 21 years and not poke the bear because that is what you're required to do. Put them on notice that you have this claim. If they don't file an action at ejectment, you can go in and get an order quieting title based on adverse possession. Under the 21 years, once the 21 years lapses, you file your action to quiet title. If they can't come in and defeat the elements that Ed just described, you're going to win. So, again, it's very fact specific. Mike and I have this debate all the time. Uh, it looked like, wow, what a great thing that they've done. Mm, have they really done a great thing? Just one other thing on adverse possession. I'll get to your question. You cannot bring an adverse possession against the uh, government. Okay? You can't bring an adverse possession claim against the state can't bring an adverse possession claim against the Commonwealth of City. The idea being, well, the Commonwealth can't keep an eye on all of its properties. Uh, feds can't keep an eye on all of its properties. So if you're bringing an adverse possession claim, one of the things you're obviously going to find out in the title report is who owns the property. If the property is owned by a municipal or an entity of the state or an entity of the federal government, you can't use adverse possession. Little, little different. Little, little different. Yeah. Yes. A uh, quick question about hostility. Um, does it matter if the permission given to claimant was false permission? Um, case in which client was living in a property uh, and took possession through a lease of a person who didn't have any authority to extend a lease, mm -hmm. um, a fake uh, landlord. I Does it matter if your intent is you are renting? Well, I haven't had that case, but I would argue that false permission is no permission, that the only one that has the right to get possession is the actual owner of the property. So I would argue in that case, the hostility was met. Right. We've had that. I feel like I've had that case yeah. and we, we, Push forward. State of mind doesn't yep. matter. Yep. All right. Ted, did you have one? Uh, you answered it, uh, I think. That's probably why I did it, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that, again, adverse possession is something you will frequently come across. I'll just beat a dead horse here. If you think this may be a case for adverse possession and you're not sure, reach out to VIP. They will either have one of their staff attorneys answer the question or They'll reach out to people like me or Bob and say, hey, can you spend some time on the phone with 
Joanne, you know, she's trying to navigate through this difficult adverse possession question. Can you help her out? So if you're not sure, again, I, I really, I would love everyone in this room to take a case. I'd love everyone in this room to feel better when we're done that you can take a case. But I also want everyone to understand you'll never be out on an island unless you choose to be. So a little bit like, you know, with, if you're in a large firm and you're making decisions you're not comfortable with and you didn't walk down the hall to talk to somebody, shame on you. In these cases, if you're not sure, Mike's here, Bob's here, I'm here, other, there are plenty of mentors around the city. There's no reason why you can't feel comfortable with one of these cases. Yes, ma'am. So if you uh, file an action of fight title for adverse possession, do you have to, the one year notice requirement, do you have to wait one year before you file the motion for default judgment? Under the 10 year? Yes, under the 10 year for a state. So you're filing a special notice. You're not actually filing a complaint. You're filing, I don't remember what it's called, but you're basically putting the party on notice of an interest based on adverse possession. They then have one year, I believe, to file the action and ejectment. And if they don't file, then you file something. It's almost automatic at that point if yeah, they I mean, don't file. Yeah, the, 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 we've done it. Oh, there's a few different ways. Right, it's, it's, not it's not specific. And it's specific. obviously, we're in Pennsylvania, don't forget. We have, how many counties are there? That's how many sets of rules we have. And so every county is given some leeway to interpret the rules the way they want to interpret them. They may have different requirements. So just remember that. Go ahead. But we filed the complaint in, in the one case where we term, affirmatively filed a 10-year uh, adverse possession case. Uh, filed a complaint, included the notice, which I, I can't remember. I think it's been like that point. Um, and then, um, then we waited the statutory period of a year. We actually did it. We were able to serve somebody in addition to that notice. But um, we are filing the motion for default this week. So um, I will let you know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the 10-year the ten statute is 42 per statute, 5527.1, which sets forth uh, all that you need to do. Uh, okay, let, let's talk about one of the real key, <coughs> key things, the key issues that comes up uh, in, in not just these cases, but most of the cases that I have uh, that involve real estate, uh, title to real estate, and that is the concept of a bona fide purchaser for value. Um, that is a, a concept which is actually codified uh, in the statutes in Pennsylvania under 21 Purden Statute 351. And it's old. And it's one of those statutes that reads on for about 50 lines of one sentence. Okay, So <laughs> rather than read it to you, um, what it basically says is that if you claim an interest in real estate and you don't record it, Okay. It's considered fraudulent and void as to a party who acquires an interest in real estate for fair value without notice. So if Bob takes a deed from Mike to a property on 123 Main Street and sits on it and doesn't record it because he doesn't want to pay the transfer tax, and then Mike, who we all think is a little shady, decides, you know what, I can get another $20,000 from that property for Ed, from Ed Hayes, and I pay him $25,000, and he gives me a deed, and I go down and record it, unless I know about Bob's deed, or unless I know Bob has some interest in the property. The fact that Bob paid for it, the fact that Bob got a deed, the fact that Mike had no right to convey the property to me again, totally meaningless. Bob's interest in that property is considered fraudulent and void as to my interest because I was a good faith purchaser of the property, okay? So it's often a tool that we use in defeating unrecorded claims to property, which we face all the time. But again, you have to be a bona fide purchaser without notice of someone else's rights in the property, and you have to pay fair value. Now, What's always a huge issue with this in these cases, and that is what you're considered to have constructive notice of. 
Okay, you're considered to have constructive notice of everything that's recorded. That's why we filed the list pendants, because we don't want someone else to be able to come in under 351 and say I'm a bona fide purchase. Well, if there's a recording that says someone has an interest in the property, you're on constructive notice of that. Also, you are on constructive notice of everything that you could learn by making an inquiry of the party in possession. Okay, so let's get Bob's situation. Bob gets the deed from Mike. It's the best deal he's ever gotten. He moves into the house. He's living in the property. Mike then gives me the deed. I go down and record it, and I go to take possession of the property, and Bob's there. And I say, what the hell are you doing here? He says, I own the property. I say, no, you don't. Bob says, here's my deed. And I said, ah, I sat in on a seminar with this guy, Hayes, and he told me if you're not recorded, I'm a bona fide purchaser for value. Law says no. Law says no. You have to make an inquiry of the party in possession to ask them if they have any rights. So if I had asked Bob before paying Mike the money that Mike stole from me, what are you doing here? And Bob said to me, I have a deed. He didn't have to have it recorded. I'm on constructive notice of what I could have learned. Why is this important? Okay, why is this important? Well, when you're talking to a VIP client who's not in possession of the property, you need to ask, who's in possession? Who's there? And then you need to do some snooping as to why they're there. Are they there under a lease purchase arrangement? Are they there with permission where they have some rights? You know, was there a deed that they didn't record? Are they an heir of somebody who was an owner of the property? Because you can't make a bona fide purchaser argument against someone in possession of the property. Now, that doesn't mean they win, okay? Because you're just on constructive notice of what their claim is. It doesn't mean if they have, so if Bob got a forged deed and he's in the property, the fact that I would have learned he had a deed doesn't mean I can't contest the validity of the deed. So you're on constructive notice of what you learned. You can still win. But you can't make a bona fide purchaser argument if there's someone in possession of the property and you haven't figured out how I'm going to defeat them. So again, I can't stress enough when you're, when you're sitting down with the VIP client, and VIP will do a lot of this you know, background work, I think, for you. But you really need to be sure, okay, what are my theories going to be? And if this is one of my theories, hey, I need to know who's in possession of the property. Let, let me make a point about this because you're often going to see these, and, and not to draw back on your law school real estate class or property class, but you are going to see strange deeds and recordings. You're going to see a lot of unrecorded interests. You will see those. You will see things called wild deeds, which I can we can get to at the end if we have time. The most important thing to remember is the action to quiet title can be used to validate what could otherwise be considered a fraudulent deed under the bona fide purchaser. Let's say Mike never does convey the property, but now a VIP client comes to you with a deed that was signed years ago, years ago, was never recorded. Uh, you think, eh, maybe we can get this recorded. You know what I do? I file an action to quiet title. I attach the deed. I ask the court to enter an order saying that this was in fact a valid and legally binding conveyance. And then ultimately the end relief is I get an order quieting title and I get the deed recorded based on the court order asking the Department of Records to record it. Then you don't have a title problem, folks. You fixed it, okay? You fixed it through a court order and action to quiet title. And now that deed, which you thought, I'm never gonna get this recorded. The recorder's office will never accept it or somebody's gonna challenge it later, you get recorded. So you can use actions to quiet title to do things like that that you might not otherwise realize you can do. And again, if you read the rule, if you read 1061 and you read 1066, 1066 is what you can do through the motion for judgment. It literally lays out for you what you can do. And if you lay out in your request for relief language from the statute, and a judge actually looks at the rule, they're going to say, oh, this person knows what they're doing. Look, they're asking for the relief that's provided for in the rule. It really is a very broad range of relief 
that you can get in a quiet title action from declaring a document invalid, declaring a document valid, declaring that one document has priority over another one, declaring that someone has no right title or interest in the property, barring them from bringing a claim. I mean, if you just read the list, you can see that I've got this full range of remedies that are available to me. I think number two, six, seven, and nine are what I would like to get in this case. So bona fide purchaser, critical, critical thing, not only from a standpoint of knowing how to use it to your advantage, but also being sure that it's not going to be used against you uh, because you're on constructive notice. Um, again, I'll just briefly say, and it shouldn't come up typically in a VIP case, but, but the mere fact that a dead person signed a deed does not necessarily mean that someone down the road is not ultimately going to prevail against the dead person's estate. And, and let me give you a rough idea how this often comes up. Um, you often have situations where, again, properties that their taxes are delinquent, uh, the property's not been maintained, there may be no roof on the building, uh, nobody's lived in the property for years, the bad guy comes in and uh, takes the property, then conveys it to someone else who then conveys it to a developer. Uh, the developer then takes what's there and knocks it down and builds a $450,000 townhouse on the property. Uh, title insurance is issued to the developer. Guess what happens next? All of a sudden, the estate who didn't care about this property for 40 years now says, wait a minute, Pop's signature was forged. We want our property back. Well, the normal law is a forged deed is void. If there's a void deed in the chain of title, then no deeds after that forged deed are valid. That's the general law, okay, with forged deeds. But there are doctrines you can use, one of which is called latches, to defeat that claim. So when I get hired in these cases, uh, I go into court and say, wait a minute, Judge. Yes, there was a forged deed. Yes, the title never should have come out of the estate, but let's be real. Okay, the property was worth $4,000 when it was forged. There were $13,000 in unpaid real estate taxes. There were $15,000 in city nuisance liens against the property. We spent $400,000 to build this property. We paid off the taxes. We, we cleared up the nuisance liens. They can't get this property back in a better situation than it was when it was sold. And if you can prove that, particularly in one of my cases where the heir of the estate would drive by the property as it was being built, um, you know, judges are going to say, no, I'm sorry. It's yes, it's a forgery. Yeah, the deed's void, but you are barred. And the quiet title rules say you can bring that type of defense to defeat a claim. OK, so so don't necessarily give up because and also understand there's a difference between a forged deed and a deed that has gotten through fraud. Okay, so a forged deed is easy. Bob owns a property. Someone else, Mike, signs his name to the deed and conveys it. Okay, that's a forged deed. The law says that deed is void. If Bob owns a property and Mike goes to him and says, hey, Bobby, um, you know what? You really should open an estate for your deceased mother. I've got the petition here for you to sign. Can you sign it and I'll help you open an estate for your mother? And one of the pages that stuck in the petition is a deed to the property and Bob signs it. So it's his signature, but he was defrauded into signing it. The law looks at that differently. The law says that's not a void deed. That's a voidable deed. Okay, so Bob, you can get it back unless someone else has an argument that it's voidable, but it can't be voided as to me, and that's often the bona fide purchaser. So I've got one right now where the claim by the former owner is handled by the Penn Legal Aid. Uh, well, my guy was misled because he was told by the bad guy he was assigning estate papers, but we acknowledge he signed the deed. And my argument is that's all fine and good, but you've got to prove 
that I'm not a bona fide purchaser in order to strike that deed or strike my ownership interest. So again, a difference between void and voidable, which you can only decide if it applies by the area of inquiry you make of your client. So again, bona fide purchaser, uh, very, very important um, concept to understand. Um, I'm going to briefly type, top, yeah, touch on satisfactions of mortgages. Um, there's statutory provisions, which are in the materials, um, that oftentimes, and this is not just for the VIP client, but the world in general, uh, mortgage companies who are legally obligated to satisfy mortgages within a certain period of time after they're paid off, don't do it. They just don't get around to doing it. So you can find a title with five different mortgages on the property from the last 50 years because nobody ever got around to, to satisfy. But it creates a problem for your client because when they go to, out to borrow, uh, the lender is uncomfortable. Well, wait a minute. How do we know that any one of those mortgages aren't paid? And how do we know we're not going to be in second position on the property? So there's a statutory uh, remedy that's available. Uh, and what I normally do in those situations, because there are certain penalties that flow from it, is before you file suit, you might give one of the statutory notices uh, that you can give to a lender and say, oh, by the way, if you don't satisfy, we're going to ask for the statutory penalty. We're going to ask for um, uh, attorney's fees, which are provided for, and you might then get someone's attention to just record the satisfaction as opposed to having to file suit. If you have to file suit, again, one of the things you can do under the quiet title rules is to cause the lender to satisfy the mortgage. Or you can have the court issue an order satisfying the mortgage. That is often a little better than requiring the lender to do it, because if you have a lender that's recalcitrant, what are you going to do? Get a court order against the lender saying satisfy the mortgage? They don't. You got to give them notice. They still don't. Then you have to file a motion to have them held in contempt. They still don't. Then you have to file. So again, time is an issue. So you don't want to necessarily do things that that are going to lengthen the process. Let, uh, and it just okay. just before I forget, Bobby, one of the other things is a lot of people in their quiet title orders okay. um, uh, put in those orders that we direct the the commissioner of the Department of Records to execute a deed of the property in favor of my client. Um, I don't ever do that, okay? I, I've sued the Department of Records, so they have, I have their attention when I ask them to do something. Um, but you don't want to be in a position where if you can get a case where the order rules that you're, or, or and issues a judgment that your client's the owner of the property, and you can just walk that down and have it recorded, I would suggest to you, again, it's a hell of a lot easier than an order that says the commissioner of the Department of Records shall execute the deed, then he's going to have to go to a solicitor. He's going to have to look at the form of deed you prepare. You're just creating an unnecessary step. So again, it's thinking about the relief you want at the time you file your complaint as to how can I get this relief the easiest. I'm well, sorry about it. No, let me make it because that's exactly what I was going to talk about. So the most important thing you want to do with these orders, and, and Ed alluded to it, is do not ask the court to order the defendant or a third party to do anything. Use your order. Use potentially, and we can talk a little bit about this, the Department of Records to do what you need them to do if you feel that it's necessary or if you feel you want to do that. Do not ask the court to order a third party, including the defendant, who may never have entered an appearance in the case, right? You may be getting a default judgment. Asking them to execute a deed in your favor, you're never going to get that relief. You're going to be filing motion after motion. So, uh, let me make the point. I, I typically, when I'm working on a title case and the title company tells me that they're going to treat that order as if it conveyed title the way I want it to, and they're going to ensure title, I don't do a deed of confirmation. We often, with the VIP cases, we will do the deeds because VIP can walk them in. They can be recorded without um, paying any fees. The recorder's office typically will accept our form deed of confirmation, and then your client walks out with a deed. I don't use them in every circumstance, though, I can tell you, and it depends on the case. If I'm trying to strike a fraudulent conveyance, we don't typically do a deed of confirmation. We just ask the recorder to strike 
the prior fraudulent conveyance. It really depends on the case, depends on the relief that your client wants, whether your client wants that or not. It does take longer. I just did one. It took six weeks really to get the recorder to look at the deed. Ultimately, they blessed it. They executed it. I got it back recorded. So it really depends. But again, if you're going to ultimately, and we'll get to the Tangled Title Fund and all that, if you're going to get title insurance, the best way to decide whether you need it or not, you can ask the title insurer, will they, will they insure future transactions based on the final order? Are they requiring a deed of confirmation? Are they requiring some other document? You want to know that potentially before you ask for the final relief, and we can talk specifically depending upon your case or the factual circumstances. In a fraudulent conveyance case, what happens if the opposing party gets involved in the case? Can you just have them sign a deed conveying it to you? No. Why? I mean, typically, no. The answer is no. You don't want the person who committed the fraud signing anything back to you. Because what, well, you're laughing, but what you're doing, and this used to come up when People were actually prosecuted by the district attorney's office as part of their restitution. The district attorney thought they were helping people and they would force the, um, the defendant, the criminal defendant, to sign a deed back or whatever. The problem is you're validating the fraudulent transaction because now you're basically saying that person did have, in fact, a right when they didn't. So the answer is no. You don't, even if they're in the case, you, you don't want them. You want their interest. You want them to be forever barred from asserting any right title or interest. You by want to strike court by court order. Exactly. Is there a situation where you might have to amend the complaint? Yes. Well, and, and a typical, <laughs> I mean, a typical yeah. situation where you might is you might discover after you file the complaint, not only a different theory upon which you'll seek your relief, or you may discover there are other parties that claim some interest in the property. So you thought there were two heirs of the dead Mr. Tintner, and it turns out he's got four. If you've only named two, the other two can come in later and say, well, that's all fine and good. You got a quiet title, but it didn't affect me. So and in the caption, putting names that you have and then and heirs and descendants of the dead person. No, nope, no, can't do it. Don't do that. So you'd have to put just, you said Jane and the other and then you'd have to substitute in if you know, once you learn the correct parties. The one I want to make a point about the orders, and we'll get to this, and then maybe we'll take a quick five minute break. But the most important thing that you're going to do in these actions is make sure that your order is correct. Because the last thing you want to do is just use like a form order that you would use on a summary judgment motion or something like that that actually doesn't give you the relief. Not only will the recorder's office not accept it. If it doesn't, in fact, quiet the title, they're going to say, what are you giving this to me for? I don't even know where to record this. Judge, uh, Judge, but Judge, Judge Fox used to say to us all the time, uh, who was the president judge at the time, I can't believe some of the orders people are bringing in asking me to sign because I know it doesn't fix the problem. Right. So she would reject them. Um, and fortunately, she knew what she was doing, so she would reject. There were other judges that, and again, no disrespect to the bench, uh, but the bottom line is you have judges who wouldn't know quiet title if it bit them in the rear end. They so, think they're granting your relief. Yeah, they're going to say, this is what he wanted. I'm going to sign it. And then what happens is two years later, when that person tries to sell the property, a title company says, what, what is this? Right. This didn't do anything. So, and I will tell you, having taken over for VIP, a case where we got a final order and it didn't resolve the title issue, you're not going to go back to the judge and now ask for reconsideration on a default judgment. What did I have to do? I had to start a whole new action to quiet title. I did, in fact, show that a prior action was filed, that the relief was not appropriately requested, and I ultimately got the correct relief. You do not want to go through all the steps of doing this to have the wrong order entered or an order doesn't, that doesn't really fix the problem. Why don't we take a very short five-minute break? There are bathrooms there's there's an individual one there's also the women's room i think is on this side the men's room is on the other side